Kurt Romer, who's the chief security strateg strategist at uh, C uh, Citrix and sometimes the chief security officer, depending on which day it is. And uh, so my first question, Kurt, is um, actually an answer. And the answer is everything. And what the question is, the is, what's different <laughs> about cloud <laughs> security? Or double jeopardy, <laughs> go. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so what is different about cloud security? Well, it's interesting. Uh, there's a lot of definitions of cloud out there, and I really go back to the NIST definition and think about uh, delivering computing as a service, and it's really different than how computing has been delivered in the past. Because of that, you really have to take a look at a new architecture, uh, especially when you're looking at security. Traditionally, we had the luxury of end-to-end -end ownership. IT owned the machines, they owned the network, they owned the data center. With cloud computing, none of that's true anymore. Obviously, security's got to evolve. Yeah, so you're talking about the NIST uh, definition of, of, of security and the NIST definition of cloud security specifically, right? So it was uh, not that long ago, right? It was, uh, let's see, we did an analysis of it, I think last February. And you know, basically, you know, the the call was we got to mature the security standards, and uh, and and where are we? You know, we like to use sports analogies in terms hmm. of uh, um, the cube, right? We've been called the ESPN of tech. So, you know, what inning are we in with regard to cloud security? Has the game started yet? Are we? Uh, are we in the, in the bottom of the first? Or are we? Yeah, game's definitely started. I, I'd say we're somewhere in the second right now. Um, there have been many organizations that have been leveraging the cloud for years, just really never called it that. Software as a service apps, you know, salesforce.com, go to meeting, Gmail. There's a lot of great examples out there of people who have been using cloud-based applications. Moving forward with some of the infrastructure and platform as a service, not everybody's leveraged those yet or really understood how to leverage those in many cases. They're looking for strong guidance, they're looking for uh, best practices and examples, and there's not a lot of prior art. On a positive note, you do see NIST, uh, you see the federal government with FedRAMP, um, with the Cloud First initiative, with some of the things going on with the Tech America Cloud 2 Commission. But then also you see the Cloud Security Alliance. You see uh, the PCI Security Standards Council, who formerly is uh, recognizing cloud computing in a virtualization information supplement that's uh, being released in the first half of June. You know, these are organizations that are very well respected and tracked, and they're actually telling us how to use virtualization, how to use the cloud securely. Is, is security in the cloud, I mean, is security in general, is it a do-over because of, of cloud, or is it was more of an evolution? A lot of times, you know, in IT we always talk about, you know, no rip and replace, getting from point A to point B without disruption. Security in some respects feels like it's um, different, that we really have to it rethink does. it. It does, and uh, in some ways it does feel like a do-over, and uh, really should be for some organizations. There are organizations that have approached security in the right way. They've thought about what their goals are, what they're really trying to achieve with their security objectives, and really the best ones have thought about security last. They've thought about security as a result. What they've done is they've gone in with their business goals and with risk management and have said, you know, what's our risk posture? What's acceptable risk? What's unacceptable? People are bringing iPads into the organization saying, connect them up, let me get on to these cloud apps. Who accepts that risk? You know, the iPad's a consumer grade device. You typically never allowed those into the enterprise. But now with the cloud, we're seeing a lot more of this. There's consumer grade devices, consumer grade micro applications on those devices, consumer grade cloud applications. It begs a different security model to, uh, to support those. You know, um, a lot of people talk about security in the cloud can actually be better. Now as a small business, I actually <laughs> kind of agree with that because I see how the, you know, my service provider's got way better security practices and policies than, than I ever had. Um, at the same time, you know, a lot of large organizations, financial services institutions, you know, pretty good security. Um, but that notion of security in the cloud being actually more secure, forgetting for a moment the small business aspect where I just don't have the resources, but do you see that uh, vision coming to fruition in the near to midterm? I, I do, and uh, you, you really hit on a key point. For small and medium business who never could really afford to have the talent, the resources, the equipment, the applications on site, moving to the cloud in a very professionally managed environment automatically gives them a better security posture than they would have had across their enterprise, regardless of how big it is. Now for larger organizations, there are some very large organizations who have done security incredibly well. 
there are others that maybe don't do it incredibly well across the board. And there are pockets within those organizations that as they move to the cloud would automatically get uh, better security. Uh, another key point to this is, any organization who still thinks that they have end-to-end -end ownership of everything and are still trying to manage their networks and all of their end users from that perspective, those organizations are delusional. And if you, you step back and say, hey, you know, we're moving to the cloud, we've got this any-to-any -any model, how do we architect security to really protect what's important to us? Take our crown jewels and make sure that they're protected at all times. Those are the organizations that are really going to do cloud security the right way and will innovate and will wind up with a better security posture because the cloud forced them to recognize issues that they've already been facing. Kerr, you talked to a lot of customers and you know that's a exact good way to put it. Say, hey, you know, got to figure out what you want to do for your business. If you had to go do a do-over and you were the chief security officer for Sony PlayStation, what would you what would you tell them? I mean, obviously, a very public, visible hack. Uh, disruptive to their business. We were talking about it earlier with one of your partners was saying, you know, the trust is an issue, the fence was broken, and no one knows what data was stolen. At least was not, no one even knows what the tracks were. So obviously the disruption to their business was significant. If you had to go back, I yes. mean, at a high level, I mean, oversimplifying things, I mean, you know, Monday morning quarterback kind of thing. I mean, how, what would you do? I mean, how would you prevent that? from happening. Yeah, first of all, you know, sorry Sony, uh, that yeah, that's a very difficult issue and it's affected everybody. It affected my son Kevin who's on yeah. PlayStation Network. Hi Kevin. Did and, you get an uh, Xbox? Uh, well, uh, so <laughs> when, one of the many millions flocking to Xbox. Yeah, well, he's, he's sticking with I mean, it and really business. loves it. I mean, billions it, of dollars of damage obviously and it's huge. I mean, it's it's, it's tremendous, and it really shows that as organizations grow up and mature and are out on the internet, you have to have process. You have to have process to make sure that you're patched, that you have active defenses in place. It's no longer sufficient to just try to keep up on the internet. You actually have to consider the internet as a very hostile environment, and you have to consider that information warfare is targeted at corporate America these days and at enterprises across the globe. Sony's learned that, and many other organizations have learned that. You need to have processes in place to keep your organization up to date. You have to be able to react quickly, and most importantly, you have to partition off these networks, these applications, sensitive data, so that it's not just get into the perimeter and anything goes. You need to have multiple partitions so that it's very difficult for somebody, even if they do break in and hack into an organization, it's difficult for that attacker to go from point A all the way through to point Z, Different. as they did in Sony. Mm -hmm. One other key point with that, though, you know, these attacks came in through the web. A web app firewall definitely would have helped. Yeah, <laughs> right. And well, explain that further, I mean, because that's a good point. Let's drill down on that. So take us through the web app firewall. Yeah, when you've got critical web apps and uh, web services out there, obviously you need to have professional development with those, you need to be scanning and assessing them, constantly testing them to make sure that they're sufficient and that uh, they're protecting the company's interests. Uh, web app firewall is a, a piece of technology that's focused on the needs of layer seven web applications, uh, HTTP, HTTPS based, and looks for signs of common attacks, things like cross-site scripting, SQL injection, parameter manipulation, Manipulation, any session tampering. It's a piece of active defense that you can put out in front of any type of web app or any type of web service and ensure that those are protected. Yeah. It's a necessity for today's critical web. Well, I'm sure the PlayStation whole... put that in center stage for all the clients. I mean, you know, is it is it uh, is it a net new infrastructure or is it you know patching their old legacy? Because you know that's the big question that always comes up is, you know, it's always great to have a clean sheet of paper but not everyone has a clean sheet of paper. They got a lot of legacy, so going to a net new architecture or infrastructure and apps, you can't just do that overnight. No, you can't do that overnight at all. And um, it's one of the, the nice aspects of a web app firewall is you can put it in front of the latest web apps and web servers. You can also put it in front of very old mainframe based uh, web apps and web servers. Uh, the protection applies regardless of what you're running. Is the PSN fail a reflection of architecture choices or bad security practices? Um, I, I won't pretend to know everything about that particular set of attacks, but I, I'd say it's more um, bad security practices and uh, a lack of process. I mean, that's usually the case, isn't it? It's either you know bad. It's processes, hard to keep up. Bad these user days. behavior. I mean, the acceleration of bad Twitter guys hack. is just too fast. 
Yeah, it really is. What's the strategy? Simon Crosby, and we talked about that on the first night, a Tuesday night, and he was like, he agreed we need to do a security do-over, meaning, you know, rethink beyond semantic and McAfee and go, you know, thinking about it. He obviously, you know, Simon's answer mm -hmm. is open oh, even source. tokens, right? right? We saw RSA get hacked. And I mean, yes. You know, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's the, the same. It can work in open source. Like, so take us through the open source view. I mean, obviously, you guys are big on open source. There is a contingency of people who want to rally around some open source. What's your view there and any momentum updates that you can share with us in, from your field? Yeah, open source uh, with community involvement and development and review really makes sure that uh, you've got visibility into the, the project that's being developed and, and the code. And also, if you have uh, an attack that is noticed or a new vulnerability, you have the community jump in determine what needs to be done and typically patches and fixes are available much much faster in an open source world because you have many many more developers focusing on it and people are using it to uh, to protect their interests we so love crowdsource i mean this has been yeah. a, this conversation yeah, for, really for several years now is how you can use the crowd to improve security and it's, it's yeah effective. i mean you look at the security market i mean obviously citrix is not that perceived as a security company or a hardware company obviously given the legacy of the business you know cisco even f5 for that matter might be considered you know in that realm as a security company. What, for folks out there who have that perception, I mean, you're obviously the chief security officer, just share with us and them, you know, what's going on with Citrix and security and, and just give them data dump on kind of where it's at from your perspective and why it's so focused. Obviously with virtualization, you can do a lot of cool new things. You sure. can spin up stuff and, you know, have a different approach. Can you share with us? and the folks out there? Yeah, it's interesting. When uh, you look at traditional security companies, you typically think about installing products and getting those in front of everything and uh, getting products installed on workstations and that provides security. But ultimately, uh, we don't believe that to be the case. You might not see Citrix as a security company and we don't either, but our customers rely on us for security every day. So we have to make sure that we're secure by design, that we have the features in the products, we have the interfaces in the products that let our customers and partners build very strong security solutions. The ISSA, the uh, Information Systems Security Association, awarded Citrix as Security Organization of the Year 2011. It yeah. was just announced last week. It's really cool. I'm yeah, very cool. proud of that. It should be. I mean, that's a design in mentality, as you said. It's not. It is. There's no magic bullet there, right? And, and it's a big thanks to our partners and our customers out there for taking a look at Citrix and looking differently at what it really means to have security. You know, you mentioned some of these breaches before. The breaches were allowed to perpetuate because there was no partitioning within the network. Once you logged in, and you know we've always had it as an industry made it really tough for somebody to log in, but once you log in, you can copy, paste, print, save, email, and otherwise exfiltrate data to your heart's content. You're right? You're in. You're in. You're in. Wouldn't it be better to partition off each application, each network? each different area of the organization so that you have automatic little walls in there that help to partition and control the spread of data. Even within uh, a particular workstation, you can partition off a browser with virtualization and make sure that even if that browser gets hacked, even if you open up that really bad PDF document and it's got a script in it, nothing else is impacted. Your registry's fine, your file system's fine, your network's well, fine, server that's kind of cool. Server virtualization complicates this you know, immensely, right? John and I were talking about, I always, always use the, you know, it's, it's a cliche, but the, the castle and the moat, and the queen mm -hmm. wants to leave her castle, and you know, I, I, I mean, but the, the point is when we talk to security practitioners in the Wikibon community, they, you know, they, that, that concept of, of putting a moat around a physical infrastructure, it, it kind of goes away in the server virtualization world, and that it makes it hard, right? Because you don't know what's connected to yeah, what. Yeah, it can. Um, and so a lot of the practitioners we talk to are, are, are struggling. But the other point that you made, which is really important, I think, and I'd like your comments on this, is you said this really, that notion of end-to-end, -end, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of illusory. Um, there is no one vendor, one outcome, you know, one out-of-the-box solution. Right? I mean, no, there, there's not a one-size-fits-all model to security either. And uh, that's why it's very helpful to have open standards and to be able to yeah. allow customers to build the right solution to meet their security needs based on those open standards. But you also made a key point. You have to have visibility and you have to have control at every step of the game. 
And so we have things like application taps and virtual taps into the environment. We've got visibility in there so you can see what's going on. And you can also have firewalls, DLP, and other controlling technologies that our partners bring to bear that integrate with these environments. If you want to have a extremely strong set of controls similar to what you would have had in the physical world, they're there, they're available, Kurt, and they work. Kurt, one of the things that we've been, we're on the, the queue, this is the queue, by the way, our flagship um, uh, telecast, we go out to events, we cover the news, the uh, the analysis, and the uh, the opinions. Of course, we supply a lot of opinions, uh, Dave Vellante and I, um, and uh, with SiliconAngle.com, the leading tech coverage of emerging tech. We go around and talk to the smartest people, we get their knowledge, we share that with you. We're excited to have Kurt here, Chief Security Officer of Citrix. Um, a philosophical question, because we were on the summer tour, uh, 2011, what about security and privacy? You know, we talked to all the leading executives at EMC and SAP Sapphire. Same question comes up. We always thought we'd love to talk about security because it's always like, you know, we're, what side of the street are you on? Kind of get a good answer there. So the question was, can you have security and privacy? If you take care of one, will you take care of the other? I mean, you guys are, that, so that's the question, but overlay that on the key theme here that, that you guys are talking about, follow me data. Yes. Okay, so data is data. That's, that's privacy, security, data. So there's kind of this security privacy meme that we're, we've been fleshing out and talking about. So can you just elaborate your philosophy on privacy and security? You fix one, does the other one go away? Are they hand in hand? Are they mutually exclusive? How do they play together? Your, just your thoughts and, and uh, religion on those two. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, security and privacy are deeply interrelated. And uh, they're also very much separate uh, separate entities. Most people, when they think about a privacy breach, it's because of bad security. Somebody hacked into a server, was able to get a list of credit cards, list of customers, was able to breach personally identifiable information, protected healthcare information, or uh, PCI information. Well, it's not always a security breach. Sometimes it's bad practices. Sometimes it's just not knowing the connectors between the applications and the data and passing more information than you need to. We need to take a look at protecting privacy beyond just maintaining strong security, but really look at what it means to protect the privacy of this data that's subject to uh, legislation, uh, increasingly a concern for each of us. You, know, you get your, uh, your credit card breached, you know, it's a big deal. You have to go through and call a company and they reissue a card and, you know, you're back up and running pretty quickly, right? What happens if your medical information gets breached? Your electronic medical records are out there. If that gets breached, there's no pulling it back. We have to make sure that as this data gets out there, it's protected appropriately and we can't rely on the mechanisms of the past. So that is a great area for the industry to come together, make sure that we're satisfying privacy, but also having the policy in place so that you can approve for the things that are most sensitive to you, whether they're shared or not, and under what circumstances. But you mentioned, you know, medical industry and healthcare, and, and that's actually conceptually easier to understand, right? Because yes. there's, there's, you know, HIPAA laws and, you know, that adjudicate you know, privacy. There's a lot of gray area in the wild world of things like social media, right? And, and mobile and consumer devices. I mean, it's a very unclear where to draw those lines. And yes. Organizations really need to start, you know, thinking about, you know, their objectives as a business. Do you see a uh, IT organizations, CIOs, CSOs, starting to have those business conversations yet? Or is it still really a security discussion today? We see uh, the more progressive organizations starting to understand that. They're having social media policies put in place. They're helping their employees and their contractors to understand what privacy-related data they maintain and are responsible for. And they're also helping educate their employees and contractors on their personal privacy as well and how that would affect them at work. You know, Each of us has a view into our privacy that we perpetuate out to the world. Some people will share their deepest, innermost secrets on Facebook. With others, it's just name, rank, and not even serial number. Invisible. And that's as far as they go. Exactly. You, some people want to be completely anonymous and uh, be in the background. Well, Scott great. McNeely, we should, Scott we McNeely should be had to coin that. the phrase, no one has privacy anymore. That goes legendary, well documented. But it's interesting. I mean, I, the, security, uh, the security privacy thing is interesting because the question we're trying to figure out, can you solve one and does it solve the other? Is there 
is there a is it the chicken and the egg or is it i mean they're definitely intertwined it's a tough one uh, yeah security protects privacy i guess that that's the one way that i would take a look at it but privacy trumps security but there's a real business model issue there too gentlemen that i think needs to be discussed here and that's the whole issue of incentives i mean as an individual i might be incentive to provide my location to you know google so i can find a restaurant uh, on the other hand i might not want to do that for facebook and so um, the notion of putting out a carrot for mm -hmm. users to actually yeah. participate and get some value out of the system that's something that's new and that you know the big data john we talk about the big data trend all the time you know it's um, you know providing information to the internet to big databases to get value as a consumer um, that's new. That's different. And now Google announced uh, their intentions for Google Wallet today. That was a big announcement. So obviously Google going from the toolbar privacy issue of data collection to now transactional data beyond checkout. It's an interesting end-to-end -end trust issue. It, it really is, especially when you take a look at uh, Google being deeply intertwined with advertising revenue. You know, having the, the data be private and um, determining what you share, we've dealt with this in the physical world for years with things like loyalty cards and programs. You go to the grocery store, they know what you buy, they, they can target you with advertisements. You know, once you're doing that online and that's shared much more, there may be certain information that uh, you don't want to share that you might want to be anonymous for. You know, what if you can see that uh, you go to the grocery store and buy three bottles of Jack Daniels every week? Uh, might somebody think differently about you because Someone of that? Someone tagged you that you didn't want to be tagged on Facebook. Exactly. You're buying Jack Daniels exactly. again for the fifth time today. You know, it's like, oh boy. Now there he is going again. We're here, siliconangle.com is the place for coverage every day on our blog, wikibon.org is where the research is, it's for free. This is theCUBE, our live telecast, flagship telecast. We go on the ground, talk to the smartest people. We have Kurt Romer, the uh, Chief Security Officer of Citrix. My final question, and then we uh, got to get ready for the CEO of Wise is coming in, Dave, is uh, you've been recently appointed April, this past April, as the Chief Security Strategist named to the US, United States Federal Cloud Computing Commission. So just share with us quickly, the government, this, you know, the side of us, we libertarians like less government, maybe Republicans don't want any government, Democrats want all government. It's not really a party of the internet. Is there a party of the internet? And there's movement now towards people seeing the train wreck of the FCC and other areas that have kind of screwed things up recently around innovation. So talk about one, the role of your role in this new cloud commission. Uh, describe it, what's this mandate, and then what's your vision for it? Because you know, we're, we're, we like the government, they do good things for us, but we don't want them to get them too much into our underwear and their technology innovation, that's not their game. So share with us. Yes, so the, uh, the Cloud 2 Commission was pulled together by Tech America, and it's really taking a look at both public sector use of uh, cloud computing as well as enterprise use. And we're providing a 30-page recommendation which will be released at the end of July. And uh, that recommendation is also going to be accompanied by a cloud buying guide to help people understand what aspects would be important when taking a look at various cloud services and how they can best choose this. It's not getting into the politics. It's not getting into you know Big Brother who's running the cloud. It's really the federal government looking at um, how to increase their agility, how to increase their responsiveness out to all of us as citizens and their constituents, increasing transparency of government, and making sure that they understand the data sovereignty, the border issues, and uh, most importantly, the interoperability, so that as the government is building out all of these clouds, and as enterprise builds out clouds, that we have the ability to take cloud environments from one provider to the next, and not have lock-in, and in this way, you really have increased the, uh, the ability for the government to serve us, lowered costs tremendously, and made it easier for them to innovate. It's really a great program. And the Government 2.0 initiative that's been, that's been out by the Obama administration, and, and kind of teased beforehand, but really Obama kind of kicked to the next level, is to get more transparency. They've done, it, they've done it in their blogging. He's got a Blackberry, <laughs> not an iPhone, but $60 million Blackberry in that, from what I'm reporting on SiliconAngle.com. That was an exclusive story we ran, $60 million BlackBerry, wow. NSA integration and everything. But, uh, you know, you got the government, you got, uh, you know, social media for the first time, we're living in this social village. So, you know, it's interesting that the government is getting involved because it's society. I mean, the cloud is an end user experience. Consumerization means people and they govern the people. So it's interesting to see how that goes. Just wondering what you see as the key 
things that we can do as an industry to make sure that we don't get too big, too much regulation, um, or no one knows yet what it is. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, my opinion is that uh, I see these efforts as being something where we're not going to have more government regulation. The fact that we've had industry members from across the board and uh, educational institutions that have been brought in to help form this opinion on what the government should be doing shows that the government is listening to best practices and wants to make sure that they're learning from industry. What that's going to do is help to make sure that the solutions that are out there are something that can be used across the government, across industry, and will be truly useful to us as citizens. Uh, you know, interacting with the government in the past, you had to get up and go somewhere. Now you'll be able to have government services available to you on your computer, on your iPad, on whatever, and uh, you'll be able to keep track of what's going on. I mean, do you know how your senators are voting and? Uh, how important issues are being decided, it's hard to keep track of these days. What if you had an online experience that let you get in there and actually influence uh, the like people to know, who I'd are like representing I'd like to know about us. my senators because I know they're collecting a lot of big data about me. Yeah. <laughs> they're one of the biggest well, customers of big data, there, Hadoop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kurt Romer, thank you very much for coming inside the Cube. It's great. Chief Security Officer for Citrix inside the Cube here, our, our flagship telecast. Thank you so much. Great thank to have you. you. Thank you. Thank you.